Hi everyone, this is Marcin Lewandowski and you're watching the Turn VC Show. Turn VC is all about going places, having fun, and interviewing some great guests from different backgrounds that turn venture capital investors. Today we are in London and we are interviewing the one and only Carmen Alfonso Rico, VC turned angel at Cocoa. Let's check it out. Carmen, welcome to the Term VC Show. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Uh, so, I know that you, uh, you know, you've been raised in Germany, but you have a very strong Spanish identity. An accent. <laughs> <laughs> so that must have, you know, that must have led to um, a lot of uh, interesting cultural clashes. Um, can you tell us, like, how did it uh, influence your approach to life and investing? It's a very good question, actually. I am, and when I joke about a lot, I actually, so I'm from Spain. My name, my accent cannot hide it. Don't want to hide it, love it. Um, went to Germany when I was 11 years old um, for the first time. I was raised in a German school in Spain. Went to boarding school in Germany when I was 11 years old. And then went to boarding school in the US. So I'm a bit of a mix of like three very different uh, cultures. Specifically the Spanish and the German in me, I think two dimensions, like as an investor, which is kind of the most immediate one, I always say that I invest in businesses that have insane customer love. And the reason and what customer love means to me is that I believe that if your users, your customers love your product so much that they build kind of an emotional connection with it, that they spend time sharing with others, like they interact through it, they build communities around it. That's actually a very high barrier of entry and a very strong driver of organic growth. So what I like is that on top of what's almost an emotional connection, you can build a highly scalable and defensible business. And I always tell founders like, there's this emotional connection that with a product, with an experience that I as, and I guess it's a Spanish part in me, can identify, can identify and can identify with. And then there's the scalability, defensibility of the German part in me yeah. that needs like this much more structure. I think, I think it has impacted how I work. And I always um, think, you know, I, I, um, I try to be nice. I come kind, I'm very Spanish in hosting people. I always want to host people, treat people, feed people. Yeah. Um, but then I'm like, execution machine like Morgan Stanley German train and I always joke I'm like yeah the yeah, I'm from Spain but I was raised in Germany and people go like ah <laughs> and so that's professionally but I think personally and I have my parents to thank for this like profoundly thank them for it for when I first went to boarding school in Germany I cried so much and I would call my parents and tell them they didn't love me like they had put me in some random boarding school and they power through it and I learned to, like I learned so many skills by having on one side a very strong family that came to visit every two weeks. It was yeah. still very Spanish set up, but yet having to build a life of my own on my own because at boarding school, like, I mean, you're in a safe environment, but it's a completely different thing. Yeah, you like, gotta get independent pretty yeah, fast. And you're, you're sick. You've, I mean, you obviously have doctors and everything, but it's not the same as being at home with mom and like, and or lots of things that happened to me at boarding school about airport drama, like trillion airport dramas, like usually come very resourceful, like very quickly because you have to, you have no option. Um, and I think the other thing is when you leave home so early um, and you learn languages as well, like your horizons like open wide, as wide as possible, right? Um, because I went from being in Spain in a very known environment where, and Spain now is a bit different, but when I was a kid, I didn't know any foreigner in Spain. Like, I mean, my friends were from Spain, their parents were from Spain, their grandparents were from Spain, their great grandparents yeah. were from Spain. And suddenly you go to a place where like, you know, your roommates are from all over the world. And I think that's a little bit what London gives me and why I'm so addicted to London is still that constant growth of pushing boundaries. Uh, and that almost like obsessed, obsession with escaping your comfort zone constantly. <laughs> and yeah, and I think that all has to do with my dad now complains that why are you not in Spain? And like, yeah. I would want you to live like next to me. 
I always tell him it's your fault. Like you raised me like that, you sent me away and gave me, sent me in a very support way, but yet sent me and show me a different kind of horizon. And I'm just really lucky that I can live in that world of like multicultural people from all over the world, constantly pushing boundaries and yet be two hours away from home, which is still very much home and I'm very Spanish. Awesome, that's amazing. Thanks you. Uh, thank you for answering. And so um, I know that you started your career in, um, in politics, <laughs> yeah. right? So, um, you know, going from politics to venture capital is like shifting from a chess game to a roller coaster ride. And um, if you could have a dinner with one uh, political figure, <laughs> who would it be? And what would be the burning question that you would like to ask them? I mean, there are so many people I would have dinner with and so many questions, but... Can, can be historical. Okay, so I guess if we stay in the political arena, um, I think... I mean, I'm political figures, but like from, from the yeah, history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, but staying in politics, because there are so many people I would want to, like, learn from that For are sure. not politicians. But no. politicians, when I was little, and in these discussions, political discussions, I always said, like, when, you know, when they ask you when you're little, what do you want to be when you're older? I always wanted to be the U.S. Secretary of State, which really? is which is paradoxical given that I'm from Spain and you need to yeah. be a, you, you need to have a U.S. passport. Um, but I was raised as if anything was possible, so I wanted to be the U.S. Secretary of State. And back then, it was Madeleine Albright who was the Secretary of State, U.S. Secretary of State. She was actually not U.S. born; she was Czech um, and had come went to the U.S. after you know, the whole Holocaust and the whole communist movement. And, and I guess, so I'm also a huge fan of the West Wing. <laughs> I guess if I could have dinner with Madeleine Albright, um, I would ask like, how are things in the situation room? And like, how does it feel when you make decisions that, when you're about to make decisions that are gonna impact the lives of millions of people in like crisis situations like what crosses your mind like how do you think about those decisions what what are the frameworks and actually how do you feel because you need to make calls like with very little information in very small time frame yeah. that are gonna really impact like the millions actual lives, lives. like yeah, yeah. what crosses it's crazy. Away. it's absolutely it's almost like yeah it's it's and I just always think like in this situation room, like what crosses your mind, right? Um, so yeah, I guess I would want to hear a lot of stories about like lots of crisis moments and, and how they went through them. Awesome. That's amazing. That's a very good question. I would actually like to know as well. <laughs> what is it like? Should we... Um, go upstairs? Should we go yes, upstairs? Perfect. That's it. Carmen, what's the origin story behind the Coca-Cola name? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so there's the official, there's the real one, and then there's the one that we kind of yeah, yeah. Uh, made sense of. Um, so I've always loved chocolate. I'm actually, I was a funny child, never really liked sweet. I don't like ice cream, I don't like, like um, candy. I just love chocolate. And, and so that's a thing of mine. Um, and then... What happened was that when I came up with like the thesis of Cocoa and this idea of VC to an angel that becomes your in-house VC yeah. and your trusted confidant and this kind of whole concept around the power of EQ, the power of small and collaborating, not competing, um, I wanted to have a name that was both cool but approachable. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, spoke fun, but like that brought people together around it. And that, and one day I was like swimming and then I, this name just Cocoa came to mind. And so I stormed out and told my husband who was there with me, Cocoa. And he said, I actually really like it. And then what happened was that very same day I had a meeting with a potential investor. Yeah. 
And so I went to buy chocolate. And we were paying uh, for the chocolate in a, Barcelo in a store in Barcelona uh -huh. called Cacao Sampaca. And at the counter, they had the faces of making chocolate. Yeah. And I saw the cocoa beans and I saw the chocolate bar. And I was, wait, pre seed seed, series A, series B, series E, IPO. Yeah. And realized that actually cocoa is the seed of chocolate. And from the cocoa beans to the chocolate bar, there are many stages like they're in the life of a startup. And then obviously you start going through a rabbit hole and you realize that the history of chocolate and, and also today the people who are making the chocolate, like all this idea of like craft chocolate and being to bar and all this movement is also very relatable to Cocoa because chocolate was very entrepreneurial and at the same time there's this, like it happens with food, with wine, with Chocolate brings me to incredible places because it's places full of people who absolutely love what they do. Like they have a real devotion yeah. for making an exceptional product yeah. and sharing that with people yeah. and having people loving their product. And I think that that's also a different scale, but the companies that I want to back and also the people I want to work with are people who care love what they do and want to share with others you love it love the origin story of the god let's um let's go to the next location let's go Carmen, thank you for taking us to another amazing place. Where are we now? We're at Ronnie's Deli, or Bagel Ronnie's Deli, Bakery. Uh, we're the best bagels in London. To me, in the whole wide world, this gets very disputed by Americans, but it's an incredible deli, and it's a place where I come every weekend and buy bagels and buy lapne and hala and lots of things to then host people at my house and or just eat it by myself. And it's a very special place to me, it's a routine. Amazing. Uh, so, I also know that you've been on both sides on the table, uh, meaning that you've been an entrepreneur yeah, yeah, here as well in this place. Every Saturday and Sunday, guys, if you wanna meet, <laughs> if you wanna meet and peace to Carmen, you know where to find her. Uh, so, um, so, you've been an entrepreneur and an investor um, I wonder how does this, um, you know, impact your investment approach? And also, so are you more, so you have more empathy for founders because you've been an entrepreneur yourself? It's a very good question. So, indeed, I've been a founder. I've what is the start of Bullard? It was a very influenced, I feel like it's like I'm still, was mainly doing consumer back then. And so I built a direct to consumer brand for pregnant women. We wanted to enable women to live maternity their own way and still feel like women. Yeah. Now, almost a year into it, totally bootstrapped. We launched from my living room, sold into the UK and the US. I realized amazing. I didn't like being an operator and I missed investing so much. Like. I realized I was an investor at heart and that was something I didn't see coming. And if you would have asked me theoretically before, if I chose breadth over depth, yeah. I would have always said depth because I was such a good student, like always knew everything to a detail. The reality is that when I had to choose, I realized I missed the breadth and I was missing the variety of topics and the variety of people. I was meeting by meeting different founders solving different problems. and. I wanted to go back to that, so I went back into investing. And I think now I am a founder of a fund. So I think I sort of closed the circle in the sense that I am indeed an entrepreneur, but I'm not an operator, I'm an yeah. investor. And that is very much Cocoa allows me to be both. And how has this whole full circle influenced me? I think a lot. You mentioned empathy for sure. I think that um, I know how hard it is. I know it's brute force and I have a lot of empathy for that. Now, 
also, and I guess the most, like empathy has been very helpful when supporting founders and knowing what they're going through has been very helpful. Yeah. Um, I think when it comes down to making the investment, the key thing that this whole experience brought me was the fact that because I know how hard it is, I know you need an almost irrational obsession to keep going. Yeah. Because it's gonna get so hard and there are gonna be such moments that are so not rewarding that either you are obsessed about the problem you're solving or you're gonna quit. And I know how to work hard and I love working and I still like quit my previous company. Um, whereas now with Cocoa, because I'm obsessed with working with founders, I can see the difference. And so I always, to me, it's very, very important to back founders that have a strong reason for going to, for the market that they're going after. I want to know that they are not going to give up on solving that problem um, because otherwise they're just going to start something else or join a normal job. 100%. So, uh, speaking of founders, I know that you're looking for killers with a heart <laughs> when it comes to startup. Can you elaborate a bit on that like what does this uh mean to you and um and how do you assess that um you know um in the investment potential absolutely i do say all the time i back killers with a heart and look to me killers with a heart is as we were just saying like somebody who's obsessed irrational has an irrational passion and a reason to solve the problem they're solving yeah second somebody who has an ambition that is so big, that is borderline naive, but not delusional. And how do you separate naive from delusional? It's a thin line. There's a kill line out. To me, I look at and I assess speed of learning and speed of execution. Because I believe that, like, I don't want you to know all the challenges that you're gonna face, because then you might not do it. Yeah. But I want you to be able to overcome those challenges when they come, which are going to come. And so speed of execution and speed of learning is a great way to assess that. Mm -hmm. And then the third thing I look for, and this is also very personal, but is clarity of mind and clarity of vision. Because I want founders with unique insights into the problem they're solving and the market they're going after. And I want them to have a deep understanding of them. And I measure that because sometimes I have a hard time putting my finger into what a founder is saying, how they're thinking about things. If it's the first call, it'll be my fault. I need to do work. Many times I'm missing context, sure. But if I do three calls, I cannot explain in a sentence what a company is doing. It's because I don't understand it. And if I don't understand it, I won't invest. But also, if it's been out there enough time and enough work, sometimes it's because the founders many times don't fully understand right. it. If it's and I just look for a lot of clarity of mind, clarity of vision, unique insight. You can explain to me in three minutes why what is the key problem in filmmaking with no background. Like it's because you understand it to such a level right. that is going to give you a heads up and an advantage in a market that might become or will become very competitive. So yeah, that's uh, those are killers with heart. Amazing. Uh, thanks so much for answering those questions here. Uh, we love the bagels. Let's take the bagels Great with place. us. <laughs> Let's take them with us and go to the next place. <laughs> Let's go. All right. So uh, this is actually our last location. Unfortunately, we made it to the hill. We made it to the hill. Uh, where are we, Carmen? We're in Primrose Hill, which is one of my favorite places in London. Um, because you can really see all of London and grab all of London. The beauty of London is that because it's all built around the river and the river goes like this, from a place like this up north, you can see all of it, all the way from Battersea, Notting Hill, Westminster there with the London Eye. St. Paul's behind the street, the Shard, which is like London Bridge, the city and Canary Wharf and King's Cross here with all the like buildings. And 
You're nearly like 15 minutes away from Soho, but this is like a little heaven, green heaven of London. It truly is, it truly is. And I think this is the time for the question that we almost always ask on the show, which is, so yeah, we want you to give an advice for uh, you know aspiring VCs. So if you were writing a book, um, <laughs> That's a lot like of hot tips. <laughs> if you're writing a like a superhero oh. <laughs> uh, guidebook for aspiring VCs, what would be your like first uh, or maybe not first three best tips, top tips for cop for a, and especially for people? What do you answer? Especially for people uh, coming from unconventional uh, career backgrounds, like me, I did. Like yourself. <laughs> Um, so if I were to write a book about superheroes in BC, I think the three superpowers I would give the superhero are muscle. <laughs> and muscle here means like brain muscle. Um, it is a industry where you need to have seen a lot to be able to draw patterns that allow you to cut through the noise Yet, you also need the flexibility in the muscle to be willing to blow the pattern because average in VC is a failure. We look for total outliers and outliers won't fit in a pattern, right? So you need this muscle and the flexibility in the muscle. The second thing I would give a the superhero is a lot of hustle because in order to see all this volume of companies, you need to be everywhere, like in venture, like sourcing is pure hustle. Like, And third, I would give it a lot of EQ because you need a network um, that is going to send you companies, support your companies, and you need to feed that network and build that network. And so I think ultimately VC is a lot around muscle and flexibility in muscle to identify and analyze companies. It's a lot about hustle and it's a lot about network. Amazing. Um, so maybe on a more personal note, I know that you love celebrating life with your family, friends, food, and dancing. Very Spanish of me. Yeah, exactly. There are very, like, there are several questions that come to mind to have knowing that. But so maybe let's start with, um, What's your favorite dance? <laughs> <laughs> what do you dance, Carmen? I'm a bad dancer, but I love to dance. No, I dance everything. As long yeah. as there's music, I'll move, <laughs> I'll move and I'll party, I'll celebrate. Uh, I dance everything, like, but not professionally at all, just because I have, you know, no ego and and no shame, <laughs> my husband would say, and just have fun. And I find dancing is a great way to celebrate. Uh, and food is an amazing way to celebrate. Like yeah. every celebration that I can recall in my life has been around the table uh, with the people I love eating wonderful food. That's why I think I have this love for food and for, because it, in our culture in Spain, like it gathers people together and you enjoy, it's like a way of share, gathering and sharing. And, and yeah, so every meal is a celebration. <laughs> That's amazing. And so since I know you're a foodie, What's your, what's your favorite Spanish dish? And um, like, what's the one restaurant that you would recommend for audience to go to? Ooh, okay, so my favorite Spanish food is obviously jamón. Uh, I'm gonna be very uh, obvious. Or you have a, a very, leg at your home. Yes, I do, because my husband is really good at cutting jamón. So we have sort of hacked the London uh, food scene with our jamón leg which also brings a lot of people together because we're very popular amongst our friends, uh, jamon eaters. And in terms of a restaurant, I mean, I get this question a lot because I have lots of lists of restaurants. I love to discover restaurants. I am all the time um, figuring out what, like where to go, what to eat. And um, actually I would say, I would recommend cities rather than a specific restaurant, I'll explain why. I think, if I could choose two places in the world to eat, one would be London because of the variety. I think London, of course, I love London, no. But London, I think, is the best place in the world to eat all types of food as a local. 
except probably Mexican and Korean, that is not as good as like, uh, you're, you can eat the best Indian food. India is the best in the world. But you can eat the best Chinese food as if, you eat dumpling as if you were in Northern um, China. You can eat Thai as if you were in Bangkok. You can eat Iranian food street. You can eat pasta as if you were in Bologna. Yeah. And like Iran as if, like Iranian food as if you were in like Tehran, right? Like I think that is incredible because uh, and that's one, uh, I th you can like literally travel the world mm -hmm. um, with food. And if people want specific recommendations, I have in mind one for each. <laughs> uh, and then, of course, San Sebastián, yeah. because I think there's no place in the world where there's more devotion for good food, quality food, quality material. It's part of our culture, it runs through our veins, it goes through generations. and. It's such a beautiful kind of part of us. And the food is just insane from Pintos, yeah. the dodgiest place in an industrial place to the highest, like most fanciest three Michelin star. It's just the culture. Gotta go, I think that's my next destination. Oh, San Sebastian is the best, yeah. the best. It's happy place and so London, San Sebastian, Menorca are my three places in the world to go. All right, amazing. So that was actually the last question. Uh, we are going to end this love letter to London by Carmen uh, by asking you, so what do you got going on in your life? Uh, <laughs> we need like many more episodes for that question. <laughs> so maybe you can share with audience like any special projects that you're currently working on with either Cocoa or outside of it? My full life revolves around Cocoa yeah. and all these events and community building is for Cocoa yeah. and Cocoa founders. Yeah. Um, but if you want to know what I do outside uh, yes. Cocoa, uh, it's all about family, friends, and then personally on me time, uh, I love to walk as you've discovered today. Yes. I take very long walks and I have great walking companions in my friends and my husband as well. I love water. I love to swim, especially in the sea, and I do a lot of that. And I love to read. I read every night, ever since I was little. My mom, who is like a voracious reader, I read everything my mom sends me, basically. And she would send us books to boarding school with like, she writes on every book and she would say, if you ever feel lonely, like, here's a book. And I learned that with a book, you never feel lonely and have lived in many places in the world. And as I build my life in each of them, books have always been there with me. And it's this thing I read every night um, and it's novels, it's fiction, it's not work and it's my me time. All right, amazing. Everyone, clap for Carmen. That's a wrap. Thanks so much for the interview. Thank you for coming.